This is the Rex check-in call for Wednesday, September 8th, 2021. I just read in late August by Peter Campion. We, um, we just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary last month in August. Um, thank Easy. you. It was so fun. Uh, it is amazing because we're only 27. So I don't understand how any of the time. That I don't know. So well, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But um, one of the things that we often do is read our wedding ceremony on our anniversary. We hadn't done it in a couple while, in a couple years. And so we did that um, this year. And the, one of the poems that we had read at our wedding was to look at two by Robert Frost, which is all about two hikers who come across two deer. And so that's, as you're reading this, this is all I can think about are the two does. Um, although it wasn't, it's not two does in, in the Robert Frost poem, mm -hmm. but then, mm -hmm. and then I realized that that's largely, um, what I'm having to do these days is think, just hold on to the pieces that, that uh, occur to me and not listen to any of the, the crumbling slag parts. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore the crumbling slag. Pretty much. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> um, and Jemay has a new family member. With the nicest shirt. It's a it's a don't nibble on your stitches uh, outfit. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, uh, Pandora Apple. was a wandering cat that wandered into <clears throat> um, Janice's sister's backyard, <clears throat> and Janice's sister couldn't take her, and so we drove up to Sacramento and grabbed her. Amazing. And after after getting her checked out and everything, and. She has not, so far, not integrated well with the other cats in the house. So she's, we still have her in the uh, in the guest room, closed in. But that's now because of the surgery. You don't want her out her wandering around. But mm -hmm. um, you know, eventually it'll it'll work. It'll be fine. She's a rare uh, female ginger. Oh, Only about that's one right. Most in, ginger's one in five, one in six. Uh, yeah. So. And you have two other. Well, cats? you fixed her so she can't have any more either. Right, right. This is the <clears throat> conversation about genetic endpoints. Yes. <laughs> I just made that connection. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> um, and just uh, in terms of vows and poetry, I just I, you're inspiring me, Kelly, to read the poem that we that I read at our wedding, which is my I think probably my favorite poem, which I've read I think on a Rex call many many moons ago, but I'll I'd love to read it again. Uh, it's called Summons by Robert Francis. And the website where it lives has suddenly gotten ads and all kinds of other stuff all over it. So I will step lightly over the ads and read uh, Summons by Robert Francis. Keep me from going to sleep too soon. Or if I go to sleep too soon, come wake me up. Come any hour of night, come whistling up the road, stomp on the porch, bang on the door, make me get out of bed and come and let you in and light a light. Tell me the northern lights are on and make me look or tell me the clouds are doing something to the moon they never did before and show me. See that I see. Talk to me till I'm half as wide awake as you and start to dress wondering why I ever went to bed at all. Tell me the walking is superb. Not only tell me, but persuade me. You know I'm not too hard to persuade. Hey, hey Kevin. That's a, a, a little more upside kind of poem than, than the culvert with the, with the deer in the, in the barcodes and wreckage. Oh, I <laughs> love that. And just that, as you mentioned it, the, the uh, um, metaphor of the barcodes and microchip for the city skyline just really worked for me. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. So here's uh, let me get a link to the summons poem at the now busy website. Sad, like I can't, I can hardly read Forbes articles anymore um, because they just have cluttered the site with so much crap trying to make money to publish stuff that you can't wade through it and do anything. It's very ad weird. blocker. Uh, I have ad blocker installed. Yeah, do you have uBlock? <laughs> no, I don't have uBlock. uBlock is uh, my my experience is the best. Use Chrome, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You you blocks the one I use. Um, I have ad blocker plus. Yeah, with the, 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 the standard. No, it's been it's not been obsoleted. Yeah. 
Darn it. Kevin, how are you doing? Good. Nice to see you. How's the how's the situation on the ground in North Carolina? Um, no flooding. Our hospitals no are not overrun, but they're close south of me in the Charlotte area. Wow. Um, and uh, you know, you might, you know, get given the, you know, both the diversity of terrain here and population. You know, the further you go out from the metro areas, the worse it is right now. So, and according to my economist, as the temperature drops, it's not going to get better right from that point. Yeah. And rural health care is not great across the U.S. So I imagine the further you get from cities, the more desperate the, just the, the care situation is. It's interesting um, that, you know, we have a fairly diverse and pretty interesting footprint of universities, state mm -hmm. universities here. And as a result, you know, we have you know, a little bit more infrastructure than you might imagine, right? Um, that's strategically, um, you know, poised to help, mm -hmm. right? Not all of it has, you know, medical, but a lot of it has nursing. But right. the, tri the triangle is one of those health nexuses in the country, right? Oh, the, the 100%. Triangle? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Durham that, that hosts Duke University, you know, changed its motto to city of medicine mm. about mm. 25 years ago, right? So, you know, lots of money, lots of research going on at both universities. We have alternative vaccine research going on at UNC right now, uh, mostly. Um, to lower the cost, make it open source and more easily produced in third world, right? That's the focus of the UNC, you know. And to, make, and to make the chips a little smaller so they're not so easily detected in the bloodstream, right? Yeah, well, you know, the, the fact is it, it's mostly in the ivermectin, yeah. right? <laughs> <clears throat> so, oh, man. Yeah, that's cool. Thank is, you. Yeah. Did you see that, the that's headline? what's happening in North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. And we are safe here in our bubble in the woods in Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. yeah. you were saying? Uh, oh, no, just a, whoops, sorry, just a question. So, on you know, Susan, I, go ahead. I, 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 ivermectin. How did that start? So um, I'll, I'll, I'll share a post from, ooh, somebody just recently wrote a great post about our, here's, here's the ivermectin story. I'll tell you what happened. And it's actually really nicely detailed. It's basically... Uh, an anti-parasitic agent that was discovered years ago that's on the World Health Organization's uh, table of important medicines, of standard medicines, whatever it's called is the name for that. Um, and it's used a lot for animals, uh, but then they discovered that it cured river blindness, for example. Um, so for uh, river blindness is caused by flies who lay eggs in your eyes and then the, the little larvae basically drill in and make you blind. So the ivermectin began to be used around the world as an inexpensive treatment for that and then a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and so when the pandemic hit, people started saying, hey, let's try the already certified drugs because they don't have to go through any kind of FDA approval. They're globally approved and inexpensive to make. And they discovered that ivermectin seemed to have good results for people who already had been infected. That apparently has, I don't think it has any preventative, like anybody taking ivermectin prophylactically is an idiot. Um, but, but in some cases, like in Peru, and a friend of ours, a retweeter, um, uh, has been like saying, hey, ivermectin is actually seeming to work in third world countries. They're using it because they're desperate. They don't have access to other kinds of things. And it seems to be statistically significant. But then since then, a couple of the, the studies that seem to be uh, pro-ivermectin, like, hey, this is working, were thrown into doubt. And now I think this seems to be a wash. So I don't, I don't really know. Um, I mean, but but it's become like the modern hydrofluoroquinone, whatever that yeah. was. We, I mean, <laughs> ivermectin's not doing anything. Hydroxychloroquine is not doing anything. It's the monoclonal antibodies that are getting some street cred. Right. Well, that's what they administered to Trump right away. Yeah. And to Greg Abbott. Yeah. <laughs> even though he didn't need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So wait, so in that story, Jerry, there's a, there's a there's the people who the people who knew thought about having using the things they already had, yes, and the drugs they already had, and then there's the part about 
the third world or people who didn't have access trying something. Are those two stories congruent? I mean, are they are, are they the same story? Are they, they seem like different populations. Um, I think that's just, I mean, I think it's the same story happening repeatedly around the world of people, uh, of many people having the smart idea of mm -hmm. let's just test everything that's already approved against this thing. Um, and then in some cases in third world countries, like, hey, in the pantry, we've already got these things distributed. What's what's working, right? So I think I think it's like a distributed, multi-headed kind of story. I don't know that it has one one hero, or one protagonist, or one place. Yeah. Uh, it does seem to go ahead. What are the theories about why it works if there are any? Um, it's a it's an anti-parasitic, so apparently it blocks a transmission vector of some sort. And I'm completely out of my depth at this point. But if you read the thread I just posted in the chat. Yeah. That, that's the that's the thread from Lori Garrett, who is um, actually a, a, an acquaintance and who's been really an important Ooh. reporter uh, in the, in this whole world. I believe but, Lori Garrett is Dave Witzel's cousin or something like that. But more than the testing, Susan, is you need to follow the money because what's happening is the people who make this stuff are quietly whispering yeah. that, oh, this is great. And it's making their stock prices go up uh, okay. because people sure. are buying it. Right. right. And, and at the same time, conspiracy theorists are saying nobody wants to tell you about ivermectin because it's so damn 100 percent generic. But that's yeah. part of the communication strategy mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, you know, this is the forbidden fruit. Therefore, you want it. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's it seems it seems yet again, really hard to step into um, uh, controlled collaborative experimentation with, you know, humans volunteering what happened and data and what they're trying and us resolving those questions in a, in a trustworthy way. That's, that just ain't happening much. I mean, botulism, not good. A little bit in your face is okay, you know? <laughs> so wait, where, where was this recently? Um, there, there was a young couple, oh God, it was some reality TV show or something like that. They're, they're, oh, oh, has anybody been watching Love is Blind or Is Love Blind? <clears throat> Are we back to river blindness? No, this is totally, <laughs> this is totally at the opposite end of the spectrum. Is Love, is Love Blind is a reality TV show, a dating show where couples had to meet in pods where they couldn't see each other. And the winners of the show had to propose marriage and actually get married at the end of the show. And the most, and, and like the most famous couple of us have become kind of media celebrities. But one of the other, some of the, some of the other characters who had sort of failed in the show, they just added four episodes. And I will, true confessions, we binge watched uh, Is Love Blind early in the pandemic. And then we just watched the four added episodes to the first season. And uh, one of the guys who's just like more of an asshole now than ever, he's like, 35 or something using Botox. And, and April and I look at you like, wait, B -b Botox at what age? And apparently not unusual. Anyway, long digression, but, but do watch is Love Blind. It's actually pretty interesting. It actually was really interesting. Janice and I watched it at the outset as well. As a sociological um, experiment, of course. And you had a clipboard while you were watching, right? Exactly. It's like, you know, is love dependent? You know, can you fall in love without knowing what the other person looks like? Of course, they all look like models. So, um, I think I'm going to have to skip this. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Right. I'll let your I'll let your you know summary. You know, your executive book summary. You know, stand in for watching the series because so <laughs> a series a series you may want to watch instead as a as a substitute. I offer two German seasons about the Charité Hospital in Berlin. I think they're both on Netflix. They, if not, they're on Prime. Uh, but the first one is just called Charité. And it's, it's you know, watch it in German with subtitles, but it's about the history. And the first one is got Koch and, uh, the, you know, uh, the first antibiotics and all that kind of stuff. And then the second season runs into the war and it's called Charité at War. Really well acted. Science is all over the place. Uh, and And then I looked up where my grandparents and their two babies lived in Berlin before they escaped in 39. And they lived about a mile from Charité. Well, so, so really interesting stuff. Anyway, if you want to watch something unusual and fun. And, and what that the, is on what? Uh, is he, I think it's on Netflix. I can, I can look Netflix, it up. I think, it's, okay. I think it's on All Netflix. Right. Yeah. Is there you were saying? Oh, no. Um, I was actually going to ask you, what is it on? Um, <laughs> but Ivermectin. Uh, it's interesting. You know, one thing that's amusing is that the 
animal dose, the dose that you give to horses, for example, is much greater than the dose that you take for humans. And people are taking animal doses and making them crap their pants. Um, basically, it seems like just all control somehow. of their bowels. Well, then and, and it turns out that um, ivermectin is now has a, a, is showing significant decrease in sperm motility. Um, awesome. So, so it's, like, a, it's a contraceptive strategy. I love this. So yeah, it's it's. It, well, it's a deworming for you. It deworms you. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, it's it's pretty. There's a lot of Schadenfreude going going around right now. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Which is actually there's some, there. Have you seen? There's a subreddit, Herman Cain Award. Yeah, that's it, a little it, controversial now. I, I I read a little bit of it and it was like, oh, it didn't really work for me. It wasn't what, wasn't as funny what, what as what are the? Uh, how do you win? What what are the uh, criteria? Well, you remember Herman Cain uh, was ten ten ten. Loved. Or nine nine yes. nine 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 nine. Yeah, um, okay. It was Becky 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 Sand uh, that guy <laughs> um, yeah. died of COVID after attending a, a Trump rally, right? And and completely dismissing COVID as an issue. Um, and of course, his his handlers kept posting under his name on his Twitter account after he died, which was it's surreal in another really self. bad. Um, but it is the Herman Cain Award is a reference to people who are loud opponents of vaccines. Uh, people who declare that, that COVID is a hoax, et cetera, dying of COVID. And okay. uh, it, it, yeah, at, at a certain level, there's an okay. And unfortunately it's turned into something as a, it, um, basically a platform for people to go after the families of people who've died, like posting horrible things on Facebook. Uh, you know, in, in the threads about the person dying. It's just, it's was this really supposed to be like an onion kind of thing that it was supposed to be funny. So uh, well, with, started, with, what was with a content, with a trigger warning, I just posted the link to the Herman Cain Award subreddit in the chat. Um, depends on your definition of funny. Well, but, but what I'm saying is it was meant to be a spoof when it started to, or, or was it meant to actually, you know, uh, you know, it was a QAnon kind of, you know, endorsement of, you know. Hey, no, no, no. Like no. It, it what? Yeah, it was it's like the Ignobles. Okay. Or the or yeah, Darwin Award. Well, the Darwin Awards. It's it's a it's a sub it's a sub category okay, of Darwin Awards. Okay. Yeah, it's basically it is a way to point out to point out the people who um were hoist by their own petard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, that are deselecting themselves from the population. Exactly, that. exactly. Uh, there, there's some really funny subreddits. There's one called, I think, Am I the Asshole? Is that right? Mm -hmm. which is really funny. Like you read stories and, and, and it's people kind of confessing to something they did. It was like, was I the asshole here? There's, there's a whole bunch of extremely good subreddits. This one didn't, didn't actually catch my attention very well. Bye Bye Job is a subreddit that is a bit closer. It, it's similar in that it's people who um, make stupid statements and suffer for it. Uh, in, this, in this case, it's people who are... Uh, you know, loudly proclaim that they are, that they'll never get vaccinated, even though they're healthcare workers, and then complain that they got fired from their job as a healthcare worker, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and subreddit has become the new sink for all that happens. Yeah. So um, the, uh, the, by the way, just north of, of where I am in uh, Richmond, they, cut the Confederate general off his uh, pedestal today and cut him in half to mm -hmm. haul him off to the warehouse. So that's happening. They could have like shipped him over to like the, the lynching museum or something like that and, and, you know, put him on the hall of shame. I mean, I, don't, I, I said, why don't you guys just, you know, uh, pony up for the bigger crane, right? And not cut him in half, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there's a little... Half seems a, little, <laughs> it's a little symbolic that. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. We could only get the uh, half ton, you know, crane from U-Haul today. You know, no, totally I, I saw agree. a picture of that. It seemed pretty complete to me. But I, at any rate, there's a Romanian town. I mean, their solution to this was: we we have this area outside of town that's available. Let's set up a park, and all these statues that were taken down, let's put them all there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I have you know an aversion 
you know, whether you like it or not, or, you know, it, it's source that you think it's an inferior form of, of art, is, is I don't like to see art destroyed any more than I like to see the Taliban destroying, you know, you know, earlier the century, Buddhist, the Buddhist, the Buddhist you know, they said, well, we don't like these. Okay. So we're going to destroy, you know, some antiquities. Now the fact is it probably does deserve to have a home someplace. Yeah. Just like, you know, Nazi art deserves to have, you know, a place. There, there was a pretty, you know, fecund, you know, period of artwork, right? It was brutalist. Is it, you know, you, you, know, the, you want to totally, like it, it right? Totally well, you don't the, have to like it, but you, it's it's part of art history, right? They totally so you, put the brutal in brutalist, didn't it? Yeah, you bet they did. Um, so, and I think I'm 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 on the same page as you are. My take is um, the monuments in public spaces, street names, school names, the naming of things around people is generally an honor to the person, and we shouldn't be honoring war criminals, basically, who are or traitors or whatever. But but. Stack, you know, those things belong in a museum. Like, there's, we have a Holocaust museum, not because we honor the Holocaust, but because we want to remember it. There are That's what Holocaust I was saying. I, I was, I was just making. You know, Mark yeah. made a really good point, which is that they were trying to find another place. Yeah. And you know, I agree with that. Right. There are a lot of people who want to see it destroyed. Right. Yeah. And that's not the right reaction either. Agreed. Uh, here in Canada, the uh, statues of the first prime minister of Canada have been taken down. Um, and uh, we have a statue of uh, Cornwallis uh, that was taken down from a local park here in Halifax. And of course, he offered bounties on skulls of indigenous people, uh, and scalps rather. Yeah. There's plenty of like plenty of nasty history to go around. I was I think I might have mentioned here I'm reading The Anarchy, which is a poorly titled but excellent book about the British East India Company and how the British Raj comes about, which is a slower process than I knew and really, really interesting. Uh, the Mughal empire was the insanely wealthy, like unbelievably wealthy. They had jewels and gold and, and every, like everything going on. And the British are like this little pesky group that just wants to trade with them. And they're being spanked and slapped out, you know, away for a while. The Dutch East India company gets in there first. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I'm forgetting, but, but, uh, the degrees of brutality as a result of the British Raj in India. Just, just that one chapter is astonishing, just astonishing. And then as part of that, there's three Anglo-Afghan wars. The British try to you know, do their Afghan thing three different times way back in the day when the great game is happening. Uh, those fail and the British army's worst loss in the field to anyone at, uh, near Jalalabad uh, is famous because there's a, a famous painting done by a woman war painter uh, later, uh, and, and these painters weren't usually at the battle scenes. They were just like painting a rendition of what they thought happened. It's a famous painting of one, one soldier surviving, making his way back to the fort at Jalalabad. Um, and, and you can imagine when the news of that whole basically army being overrun and destroyed by Afghanis got to London, there must have been just havoc because mm. you know sometimes you didn't know that you'd lost a major battle for six months because the news didn't make its way back. Uh, so all kinds of interesting little tendrils there, but but the, but I spent a little while sort of looking at. I, I watched a video. Actually, let me let me screen share to the to that video for a sec because um, so there's a there was a, a video on the history of Afghanistan, and I watched it and chronicled it in my brain because I like to do that. And here it is, ba -ba -da -ba. and so. You're, you're an Afghani family. You have been under the Timur, which is Tamerlane, uh, the three Anglo-Afghani wars, the Soviet war, the American war, uh, Nadir Shah, the Parthian empire, Persian empire, Safavid dynasty, Safarid dynasty, Sasanian empire, the Tsar revolution. Uh, here's the massacre of Elphinstone. That's the, the thing I just mentioned. The Durrani empire, Alexander the Great was there for a while. Ahmad Shah, Durrani is part of the Durrani empire, the Achaemenids, the Abbasids, uh, the Ghaznavids, the Gurids, the Hotaks, like you've been under everybody. You're, you're an Afghani and you really, you've hardly ever just been like tribes people enjoying Afghanistan in whatever way you might be able to enjoy it. It's bad. And I don't know how many of these empires were benevolent or, or good for Afghanistan or anything like that. I think it was just, you know, they're, they're weirdly, 
um, geographically located right on the Silk Road, like, like it's desirable territory for anybody trying to conquer stuff and get from A to B. Afghanistan? I, which weirdly, because Poland is like flat and in a bad place too. Poland has, uh, has not been Poland that often that long, Estonia even less, because very desirable, but flat. You would think Afghanistan being all mountains would be like Switzerland, which is like, hey, we got natural defenses here. So we just sort of wall off the passes when we need to, but it's well, not. I, I, think, I, I think the conclusion you can reach is that it is, but nobody has, uh, has actually learned that lesson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like a, it's like the, it's like the, the scorpion trap. Nobody knows to avoid. Right. I was um, reading it some interesting detail about uh, July 3rd, 1979. Zbigniew Brzezinski had a meeting with Jimmy Carter and said, you know, this, they're this secular kind of left leaning Russian leaning government, uh, you know, women could walk around. And in fact, the vice president of Afghanistan was a woman. And, but he said, the, 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 these groups, the Mujahideen, they're opposing this secularization. Let's support them and that'll suck the Russians in. Mm -hmm. The rest is history, mm -hmm. basically. But it's kind of ironic that the Americans basically destroyed the status of women and then now there's all this talk about, oh, we're leaving and what about the women? Mm -hmm. Thank God you're leaving. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so all, this, this whole little thread started with the, the, the nastiness in history. Like why humans are so so crappy to each other so often so consistently over time. Well, just as the end of that, was... Sorry, I say that, that Mark, because I actually wrote my history thesis on uh, revolutionary movements in Afghanistan over the 20th century. Uh -huh. um, I did not know that. So that was back in back in uh, eight. See, I graduated. That would have been 87, 88. So is your link anywhere online in a, like a dissertation no, database? No, unfortunately, or something? I, I have a printout of it, but. Uh, you know, it's lost to the vagaries of unsupported digital media. I could add um, it to my brain if they had a thermal link. But uh, I might, have, might end up doing that. Uh, but the, actually, the, what I was going to say is that to whatever degree the American support under Carter and Brzezinski made, it, made a difference for the, uh, for the Mujahideen in, in, uh, in 1979, that was an ongoing cycle. There, that was like the third or fourth um, Tribal uh, uh, tribal groups overthrowing centralized government in Afghanistan in the 20th century. Um, it, it's just a recurring story. And in this case, the centralized government had had friends in in the Soviet Union and called in for help. And you know, uh, Brezhnev at the time said, "Hey, look, it's centrally located. We can get anywhere from there." Um, and then all you need to do is shift over a country or two and lather, rinse, repeat. So the Shah of Iran uh, was put in by the U.S. after we deposed Mossadegh, who was a democratically elected president of Iran, who was actually a smart and good guy and just a little too close to the Soviets for us. So we took him down and put in our man and completely screwed up the region uh, again. We could have shut down Guantanamo and just moved it to Bagram. Yeah. Oh. Uh, there you go, right? Yeah. If, if you don't think we have other black sites, okay, to move people, yeah. we're using them right now, right? The people yeah. who don't have the credentials, right, right, are quietly being escorted from Qatar and other places they landed to, you know, the, yeah, oh, where did they go? To right? other places, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, there's a, now a whole bunch of Afghan rebel, uh, 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 not rebels, uh, uh, refugees in the world who, in a, in a world that's much less accepting. It wasn't very accepting a little while ago, but now it's just worse. It's going to be a real headache, I think, and a political issue in lots of places. Sorry, Mark, you were starting to say something. Oh, no, just mentioning places, Black, Diego Garcia is this island, you know, off of India where the U.S. is. Where the U.K., I believe, evacuated the citizens and moved them off somewhere. And they've been suing to get their island back. Their yeah. descendants, they got shipped off to Sri Lanka or somewhere. I don't remember where. Um, so where's a great, where, where's your favorite, anyone's favorite place in history where things were good? Uh, people, place, uh, any time in history. Any time in history. Any time in history. People, place, uh, Susan, you're muted. How, how small can the place be 
it could be eight people at this point because nobody's coming up with ideas. So I'm good. I'm, I'm good for, I, I'm good for small. Yeah. How about, uh, you know, for me, you know, Kansas city, 1960. Casey. Oh, so you're talking about like personal life. Lee, kind of it was actually Leewood, Kansas. That, that was a great place. You know, I was about, I was four years old <laughs> or to four to six, right. That, that was, was, that was a wonderland. Right. Was it kind of sort of idyllic rural America sort of wonderland? Is that the, the picture you would... I don't know. It was a, it was a new subdivision. Um, and I don't know. It just was, it, it, it was a good place. It was I know I was, I was hauled off a lot of times to the emergency ward because I kept on cutting myself on things because I was rambunctious. Uh -huh. So, you know, I was, uh, I had my frequent, you know, stitches you know card at the hospital but yeah you know i i remember malcolm gladwell in the intro to one of his books writes about how they used to live in long island and then one day his dad got a promotion so they moved to westchester or something like that and all of a sudden like the weekend block party barbecue died because where they lived in long island there they lived in a cul-de-sac it was cheap it was like they, nobody was wealthy but every weekend somebody would come feed the, put charcoals, you know, put Kings for mm, briquettes yeah. in, in the brazier. And the dads, uh, the dads in the neighborhood would bring like, like the meats and the hot dogs out and all the kids would play together and shaboom. And then when they moved, everybody had their own barbecue out on the porch and nobody was using them or inviting anybody else over. And, and sort of this, the, just these varied notions of community and connectedness mm -hmm. uh, uh, as they correlate to poverty and wealth uh, and all and cocooning and, and whatnot. It's super interesting. Well, I would put forward um, North Newton, Kansas. North Newton. In Kansas, yeah. Um, you know, for uh, where I spent a lot of time, um, and of course, and it was a, a largely Mennonite community. In fact, I put some Mennonite communities, you know, there, and I and I say some because, well, some of them weren't wonderful. The one in I, ha I have two guys building building a shower and a toilet in my in my um, attic and at the moment, and one of them is a descendant of the Aztecs. And when they found out I was Mennonite, they had all kinds of questions because he and his partner were looking for a place to move. And he said he said and he had thought about going and joining the Mennonites. Of course, he knows about uh, the Mennonites in Mexico. For mm -hmm. instance. Um, but you know, those are those are there are lots of those communities where everybody gets taken care of. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, in a lot of religious communities, they look outside of the secular world and like, who are these assholes who can't take care of their people? <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> I know. <Mark. laughs> I like it. Sorry, I missed what Mark did. I was. Well, you uh, see, Mark put in chat. Says we're not in Kansas anymore. I exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah. And your little and your little dog Toto too. Annie M. So I'm, I'm, it's a twister. I'm trying to I'm trying to <laughs> stop I'm, it. I'm, I'm trying You're to talking remember. Talking about my home. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know. I mean, the fact is that that's where my birth certificate is from, Kansas City, Missouri Hospital, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but I didn't get to stay in Kansas City. I had they I was adopted, so they took me to Tulsa, and Ooh. then got moved, got, you know, by IBM from Tulsa to Kansas City. So they moved back. And then I, you know. How was Tulsa? How was Tulsa? I mean, the family is from North Central Oklahoma and Tornado Alley uh, in Perry, which is near OSU or yeah. what was Oklahoma A&M. Yeah. So the. Well, uh, you know, uh, my father grew up in a small town east of Tulsa. And uh, well, he grew up in the country there. It was it was farming country, so um, I have Tulsa in my background. I was kind of following the, you know, after Kansas City, the path for a couple of years or several years of, of uh, racial you know issues because oh. we moved from Kansas City to Memphis and there were race riots and my parents put me into a Methodist church school, and when I moved to Chicago. We were in a development and I could see the elementary school I was supposed to go to in my backyard, but they started doing busing. So I couldn't oh. go to that school. 
Yeah. I had to walk past that school and go to another school in Highland Park. Wow. And remember, I just told you I was in a Methodist private school. This is a public school, but 80% of the students that went to that school were Jewish. And the contrast effect was very interesting. Um, and you know, it just broadened me out a lot before I moved to Connecticut. And, you know, so I, those were kind of gifts in a way, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I, I was getting a lot of different experiences in a very compressed period of time when I was growing up. I wonder if it, there must be writing, Jerry, um, about, about the sort of what you just described as a kind of uh, more cosmopolitan life, uh, because your father, your parents moved around a lot. And yeah, uh, well, you know what, my dad and his sister, um, and this I am going to write about, he grew up on a train. His, wow. his grandfather was the track foreman for the Santa Fe Railroad, building wow. the second line between Texas and Chicago. Yeah. And as they built track out in the prairie, yeah. every two or three weeks, they'd change schools. Every one, two or three one weeks. room schoolhouse to the next Same. one room schoolhouse, right, in wow. Oklahoma, Kansas, Illinois. Right. And the fact is that, you know, the there was a, you know, a car, you know, a freight car that was converted into the track foreman's apartment. Right. And that's what they grew up in. That is amazing. They must yes. have and so they, the, we didn't think twice about moving. He said, oh, well, you know, no problem time to go, you know. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to we're going to hook up to an engine and be somewhere in, you know, in a couple hours. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there's a thing called third culture kids, which I realized later I kind of was, uh, which is interesting of its own. Um, and, you know, the idea that you don't really have roots in any one place, but you've got lots of little roots in lots of different places and, and so forth and so on. Yeah. And, and then back to recommending TV series, I stumbled across a rotoscope animation series called Undone. And I put a link to the Wikipedia page in the chat. It was really, really good. And there was only one season of it, and it's kind of a cliffhanger because they don't resolve the plot. I don't know that they funded us uh, or approved a second or third season, but it was basically, uh, it involves time travel and losing your mind and stuff like that in animation. And the rotos and rotoscoping is basically, they use actors and act things out, and then they process that whole thing so it looks like animation. But what that gives you is a really rich, visual medium where you can suddenly blend into uh you know fantasy or psychosis or whatever else and they use it very very well it's like really like the it's very artfully done i liked it a lot it's actually yeah. like uh reminds me of the um in the the school that i taught in in uh, the congo then zaire briefly um where it was it was allowed for people to go crazy uh, when the dry season started. So wow. if you declined to go crazy, you could. Wow, there was like an opening for it. Hey, it's opening crazy season. It. It's really, yeah. And we had a woman who almost naked showed up in the yard and I asked the gardener what that was all about. And that, that's what he told me. We have that here, it's called election season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Jume, go ahead. Well, there are also festivals. Oh. I mean, many cultures have festivals like the, you know the uh, the throwing oranges in um, whatever that town in Belgium is. Root? No, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Yeah. Everybody gets to go throw oranges once a year. I mean, it's 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 a good thing. Jerry, thank you for straightening me out on rotoscoping because I really thought that was an early form of oral surgery. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, separate thing, but this came up yesterday in a conversation here. Um, uh, animal tracking. Um, mm. I watched a video about a guy named John Young, who's an animal tracker who studied under Tom Brown, who's the famous, one of the famous ones, who also was a mentor of uh, Kevin Jones's, by the by. Mm. Um, and so this, in this video, because I was in a conversation here about how did early people, hunter-gatherers track animals and like, did they do a grid and say, you take that part, you take that part? No, they must've done something else. Well, it turns out that in this video in modern times, they were, they, they had, apprenticed themselves to the Hadza and other tribes and, and so forth. 
you kind of become one with the animal. And, and the theme, part of the theme of the, this video, which I'll put a link to, is about cross-species communication. Yeah. Um, and what happens is when, like you find a place where your prey seems to have lain down on the path, and you sit there and you kind of go into neutral and put yourself in the mind, in the frame of mind of that antelope. Um, and all of a sudden you see sort of a silver path ahead of you and you just follow the silver path. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to worry about broken twigs and scat and footprints. I thought that's all the tracking was, was like evidence, physical evidence in the world of where the critter was. And there's this whole other aspect and angle to it, which is about stepping through and being one with the animal mm -hmm. and, and sort of following the, the little thread that, that leads you to it. And yeah. it's, it's kind of mind blowing. I just finished Lonesome Dove, which I had never read. And nor have I. And uh, it's 850 pages and it's extremely male. And so I thought, am I really going to do this? And I'm glad I did. Um, and, and anyway, so they, they had learned a lot from the Indians about how to, the cowboys, about how to track animals. And it's not exactly your point, but the point was you have to they didn't use the word become the animal, but basically it was like that. Right. And they would track them for days, weeks. By the way, the word vaquero, so a lot of the original cowboys were black and mm -hmm. Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. The original cowboys. The word vaquero is cowboy in, in Spanish. Bacaru is an Americanization of vaquero. Really? Yes. Wow. I didn't know that. and. Yes, and in the story, there is a black cowboy. Um, there's a black cowboys group down in LA, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So, I want to bring up a question here. Go to go back to Jerry's question on, um, you know, when was a really good time in history? Thank you. Please. And <laughs> well, part of uh, part of what we're telling stories about about when we got started on the good things was. Um, you know, what was going on, it's always been going on that way. It's always been horrible and there's always been care. There's a piece, I have to find the link for it, which I will put in uh, in a short bit, um, sort of chastising the media about, you know, telling the whole story about COVID and nothing about all the people who took care of everybody. I mean, that's finally getting into the mainstream press, which I thought was great, uh, a great commentary. And it's so often, I had a neighbor here who um, came over to, never mind why, uh, they come over, we had a bottle of wine, we talked. And she was asking, she's an artist, um, had studied in India and in Japan and does beautiful, beautiful textiles. Anyway, and she said, I'm so tired of only bad news. What, I said, there's a lot of good things happening. And she asked me, well, where are they? You know, where can I read about them? Where can I talk about them? Why aren't they? Of course, they follow mainstream media pretty much. And, uh, and so I, and watch TV. Um, I, um, I have sent her two links. One was to Noema, um, because I thought maybe those short blurbs that they write there, which I enjoy and read every week, the newsletter, uh, would be about bite size, the right bite size for, for good stories. Um, we'll see what happens. The second thing was this article that I can't quite remember, but talked about um, why we don't know about all the good things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that the good things are in the longer form narratives. They're not in the short burst stuff. Well, that they need to be. I mean, I think if people are gonna read short burst stuff, then maybe we need to do that. Well, I'm just saying that they, yeah. they've tried good news, news services, and yes, people don't wanna pay attention to them. I know. Uh, yeah. I mean, because... it, that's, I mean, we know that people don't actually. They'd rather have something exciting, you know, t titillating, something. Well, if it bleeds, it leads, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So my 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 own amateur history version of this is that early peoples managed landscapes. They didn't have individual plots of land, but um, I'll just do a little brain share here because I've got a bunch of stuff on this. Um, Aborigines domesticated the landscape, not individual species. Much of the American landmass, North and South America, was under active human management. If you read yes. Charles Mann's books, 1491 and 1493, yeah. uh, here's 1491, the new revelations of the Americas before Columbus. 
uh, he will, and, and, and then if you go over to satellite archaeology and people doing core samples in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon forest, they're, what they're discovering is someplace where it looks like nobody's ever lived at a junction of a couple rivers, there's a mound, a curious mound. So you take a couple core samples of the mound and what you find inside the mound is broken pottery. <laughs> and broken pottery and ash and what, what there's a thing called terra preta, prepared earth, which makes earth very fertile. Mm -hmm. And part of what you do is you put the human wastes like fish bones and, or, you know, your compost, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some, some ash, some burn and some pottery, and you mix that into the soil and it makes the soil really fertile. So they do core samples around and they do an estimate. And it's like somebody in the middle of what is now jungle made 100,000 clay pots and then disappeared. Right. And, and, and so anyway, so my amateur version of history is that around the world, we knew how to live on the land, but we weren't making big ziggurats. We weren't making penis monuments. We weren't like, like, like we were, we figured out if we didn't kill ourselves off, which humans are really good at, we were living together well on the land until we were destroyed basically in the colonial era and some, you know, some earlier efforts. But, but, but those, those cultures succumb to cultures of guns, germs, and steel, right? So the, the, yeah. the, the Alfred Crosby thesis uh, and then other sort of ideas of, hey, if you're pacifist and you're sort of elegantly living on the land, it's gonna go down. And so when the first fleet shows up in Australia you, and you read those people's diaries, they're like, they, they're like, they ride their horses into the, to the forest and they're like, this is like a gentleman's garden. You reach up and there's an apple, you look down and there's a gourd. And they don't realize that that's because the Aborigines were cultivating the space that way. And they attribute it to just as just the way nature is um, that these Aborigines look lazy and stupid. And then of course they treat them that way forever. And then, then the, 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 the Europeans bring sheep and let the, the sheep loose on the land and the sheep basically destroy the manicured landscape. The sheep eat all the good stuff that's been left out for humans to feed off of. It's super, super interesting. Anyway, um, so I think that there's been lots of like idyllic, not idyllic, lots of groovy civilizations that understood how to do, many of which were matrilineal, like the Haudenosaunee uh, in the American Northeast, matrilineal all the yeah. way down. Well, the landscape management template has simply re been replaced by strip malls and franchise places. I mean, the, 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 you know, the food that's on the floor is simply, you know, the availability of a Burger King or Taco Bell, you know. But so. also the, the notion of stewardship shifted into the notion of ownership. And then we made ownership preeminent, like, like libertarians are all about ownership. And the only reason for a government is to protect my ownership of stuff. And so for me, ownership is not the best word anymore. Like I think stewardship of the commons is a great phrase, mm -hmm. uh, but how, you, how do you shift people out of something so buried so deep? These notions are buried incredibly deep in the birth story of America, uh, the whole thing. You know, you might be able to usefully, you know, make that full circle if you said, you know, that the American Indian was actually libertarian, except that the space that was owned was a shared space. Which we brings, all own it, okay, brings, or we are all part of it, okay? Yeah, which brings me to a tiny video I'll share that I did years ago. You might have heard me say this, because I'm sure I brought it into one of our calls, about the difference between the words ecology and economy. So they both, they both come from the Greek root oikos, which is the household. Yeah. They both seem to mean management of the household. And in the video, I say the different, and, but they're both in conflict in our heads, like ecology and economy can't somehow cooperate. So for me, the difference is that economy people think that the household is me and my nuclear household in right. a zero sum game for resources against everybody else. And right. ecologists think it's all of us on the pale blue dot making this thing survive so that future generations can enjoy it. And it's the size of the household, the metaphoric size of the household that is the biggest difference under the hood. Right, and the fact is that if, if you take that, the word shareholder and stakeholder disappear. If shareholding means that we've all got shares in, you know, we're all sharing, you know, all the resources. You know, if, if shareholder does not become a single entity, Right, that it becomes part of an interconnected, right? But you know, the fact is, uh, right now, as you've heard me, you know, say before, 
large swaths of, of the planet are fixated in adolescence and never graduate to interdependence. They just, you know, fixate on independent and, you know, the smaller unit. And, you know, that means that on a societal level, we don't always get to a fully formed prefrontal cortex at a group level. But so how does that, can we resolve that with the idea that long ago, before we screwed things up, we were actually more adult, more intelligent? Because when you say that we're stuck in an adolescent level, the place I go to is like, well, that means that long, that before that time we were children and we're trying to become adults and integral or whatever. But, but my but, you know, my, is, my span was very short. It was not. Yeah, but, that's but the wrong. fact is that- well, that's true, that's true. You I know, just, one of that, the things that we totally spent a lot of resources on is you know, conflict resolution. And one of the mechanisms is war. That's win-lose, all right? That, that, that's an adolescent strategy, okay? Because there are, you don't get to any win-win thinking until no. you grow up a little bit. Go ahead. Well, I guess the, the question is, um, how, how do we, I mean, there are some radical possibilities here, right? Mm -hmm. And, but they're too radical to do. So we might as well just keep our heads in the sand. It's okay. So what about another kind of <laughs> attitude? I think no. there are things that no, can let's be done. Up. Mark, say it. Go Just for tell it. Tell us what you think. Well, for, for example, uh, right now it's becoming more and more common here in Nova Scotia, the province where I live, to say we are on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. So this is unceded territory. There was never a legal transfer of quote unquote ownership. So it seems to me that we need these kind of radical judo moves to try to somehow flip things so that we don't just talk about this, but we actually make it real. Um, so th this is one thing I'm really intrigued about. And I think there are, par I mean, there are some parts in the US as well where that's also true. There is unceded territory. And you can say, well, so what, big deal, you know, <laughs> go back to your little hovels. Um, but I think, you know, maybe there are leverage points potentially. And, and I think we need absolutely radical leverage points uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm usually a positive person I'm getting more and more depressed about all this. No, stuff. come back from the edge. No, the I mean, Jaime, I, I read your article, you know, and we, at least where you were quoted and, you know, saying, well, these conventional measures, you know, won't do. So how do we go beyond the conventional measures? You know? I, honestly, I wish I knew. You know, if I knew I would be the master of the world. Um, so no, I mean, <clears throat> unfortunately, historically, the mechanisms by which we adopt uh, radical measures have been, uh, well, in the words of the recent conversation, fairly adolescent. Um, we tend to adopt radical measures through violence mostly. Or crisis. Um, or, I'm sorry? Crisis. I mean, it doesn't. Or yeah, yeah. Suffering. Yeah, maybe suffering. a better way of uh, suffering. Yeah. Um, and for me, that that weaves back to some of the conversation. Um, you know, actually, the conversation across this this morning. Um, in the in the idyllic spaces, in the good the good point, good times, good locations, in a a world of adults, who is suffering? Um, when you talk about, and I please don't take this in any way as being disparaging towards me, towards any of you personally. When you talk about Kansas in the 1960s, I'm thinking, well, what is it like for the black people who are living there? Yeah, I was. Uh, and, you just, I'm not being defensive, but it was just a reference to my experience. Oh no, no, I, I, I didn't know, even I know did. that there were black people in Kansas. Right, at no, the and, time. And really, just, <laughs> Kansas really was trying really hard to not. I found it. out in Memphis really fast how you know yeah. Uh, yeah. contrast effect but you know the point is you know who is suffering so when i think about you know a you know a world where people are less focused on the individual it's like okay mm -hmm. that's great if you're part of the if you're part of the mainstream but if you have uh, parts of your yourself that don't fit into mainstream views if you're gay in a lot mm -hmm. of places around mm -hmm. the world and a lot of places historically. Um, what does that mean if you're stepping outside the norms? If you have decided not to reproduce, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there are a lot of, there are there are historically a lot of places in the world where that was almost as bad as being a deviant. I mean, that you were a deviant basically if you weren't having kids. Um, and so, so I think about these things and I ask, well, who's suffering? Um, but you know, in, in in reference to what Mark was asking about, it's like maybe suffering becomes necessary. Suffering becomes a catalyst. But in the scenarios I'm talking about, about the way back when indigenous tribes everywhere, some people were suffering who were probably ostracized by their communities, but probably because they were bad actors in their communities, et cetera. I'm not, and, and I have a general thesis that capitalism only pencils out when somebody is being squeezed and suffers, but that's capitalism. And I'm talking about sort of pre-capitalistic societies where I'm not sure somebody needed to be suffering. I, Jerry, you and I have had this conversation numerous times in the past. I, I, I feel like you have a um, an overly utopian vision of what pre-capitalist societies uh, were like. I think you, and I suspect you believe I have an overly cynical view. Um, but uh, I'd love to know where we all land on that spectrum. Yeah. <sighs> so why don't everybody put your put your um, actually so uh, hold up hold up one to five fingers. Uh, one is like pretty, pretty sort of negative. Most of humanity has been nasty, brutish, and short, et cetera. Five is like pretty optimistic, uh, things that are, <laughs> and Susan is holding up the correct one finger expression. So, so go ahead, everybody. Yeah. All right. Two, three, you're like right in the middle mark. The, uh. I mean, if I, if I take the longest view that I can for humanity, I'm going to have to agree with Elon Musk that it's an imperative to become an exobiological species because the sun doesn't last forever. Eventually, you know, this becomes uninhabitable. So it's, you know, we have to spend a little bit of our time, right, trying to figure that out, right? Do we have to do it immediately? Right, heat pump guys here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, it, it's kind of like you know a savings account. We need to spend a little bit of our attention um, on a surviving in the moment, whatever that means, and then we need to you know be able to have escape velocity, all right, so that we can be elsewhere. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's my that that's the law. That's as far as I can go, um, in terms of perspective, and you know I, I do spend a little time trying to think about that. Um, so, um, I actually have something I've been doing recently, writing a piece for IFTF um, on a concept I've been picking up for a while. I call it uh, foresight forensics. You basically go back. At, Say it again. Foresight, foresight forensics. Okay. Okay, You're good. basically going back and looking at old scenarios, old forecasts, and digging through. It's like, okay, what worked, what didn't? Why, you know, what did I miss that I should have caught? You know, what are the things that, you know, basically trying to unravel how the world pre- of the future presented in an old forecast mapped against the real world, not as a, I got this right, I got this wrong, but why, did, why was I thinking that? What did I? What did I miss? What dynamic factor did I miss? If you I could be a scenario quick? archaeologist too. Pretty much. <laughs> but, and one thing, I, no, no, it's, yeah. and it's, well, I, I tend to call force futurism uh, anticipatory history. Yeah. And so yeah. it's not very uh, seldom. Exactly. Right? Yeah, psycho history. Um, and, and the Foundation series coming up on Apple TV looks really good. Yeah. Um, great. But what the point of all this is that. I have discovered that I am a, I am painfully optimistic. What? Because yes, if you go back and look at what? And look at these scenarios and these forecasts, invariably, I have at least one of the forecasts, one you know, one aspect of the forecast, one of the scenarios being people get their shit together, that mm. you have global cooperation on, around climate, that you have people making making the hard choices that need to be made in a way that's beneficial towards future generations, not towards the immediate benefit. Um, and I keep, in, keep going back to that, even you know, when it's 
Uh, yeah, yes, you can say, well, there's a good scenario, bad scenario. No, no, I'm talking about like where it's just near forecasts of what should the world, what what are the factors that are shaping the world? Mm -hmm. And they just keep coming back to having these. Even though reality keeps slapping you in the face. I know, I know. Reality is. You keep coming back for more. So, um, it, you know, thinking about this conversation and just, I actually am a lot, apparently, I am a lot more optimistic than I like to portray myself as being. Interesting. So come to the lighter um, side. Come to the, to the optimistic side. Why? Because it's more hopeful. It's more fun to wake up in the morning. Well, that's it's actually a reasonable and, reason. And be, and, be, and be bitch slapped by reality every day. Yeah. Well, the, statistically, the percentage of humanity that is in conflict has been decreasing. Yes. There's a whole okay, bunch so of people... the fact is that the, the that the general trend, although it's hard to perceive it, right, is that we're we're actually less in conflict, right, and consuming fewer of our resources uh, on that than we used to. So this mm -hmm. is where I, this is where I come on, brain. Don't be so slow. Uh, this is where I collect all that evidence and all those stories and all those books. Uh, so it's it's Hans Rosling, it's uh, Steven Pinker, yeah. it's uh, the the, the new optimists is kind of a category for it. So there's a, a bunch of thinkers these days like Johan Norberg, Max Roser, Steven Pinker, uh, and a few others who are um, on, on this point of this particular point of view. Which I personally don't buy enough. I, I'm, I'm like, if things are so much better then why are things so screwed up? So that, to the point where several of the things we've done might actually end most life on earth. Because I think those things are, are better at the granular level and much worse at the systemic level. Yeah. yeah that I, we've I, got, we've I, gotten I better that. at- Yes, write that down. We've making people live well, but not very good at making the planet. Yeah, we've yeah. got to dis distribute it better. We, we still, yeah. do, I mean, uh, you know, we still educate people, you know, the people who are high, you know, have the highest education are drilling down very deeply into very narrow silos, okay? There's no yep. specialization in generalization, right? That we don't offer that degree. And so the fact is we need to, the, where you see some evidence of progress in that direction is nanotechnology. It requires cross-disciplinary cooperation to move it forward. You know, it requires physics and chemistry and engineering and, and, and. Uh, so the fact is um, we need to be able to go back to the zero hundreds in the library where, you know, we say this is the organization of human knowledge, all right, and not produce a librarian, produce a generalist system, you know, set of systems thinkers. So I'm not a big fan of and our be our able family. to employ them. Wait, wait, <laughs> yeah, wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. Isn't there wait. another? There isn't there another way to think about this? Sure. I mean, there always is. But um, I got fascinated a few years ago when I was trying to um, invent a company with consideration of the literal I L I T T O R A L, and I think we need to cultivate the literal. I think we need to be able to go see those places as just as legitimate as, um, because that's where the interaction between the systems and the, the local systems happens. And, and uh, we generally leave that. Okay, so take, take the shoreline, okay? Um, and, and- Like a marsh, about, right? A uh, salt marsh, right? Or a salt marsh, for instance. Mangrove, and then mangrove. They're all between the salt marsh and the ocean and, you know, yep. and lots of stuff happens there. Uh, most evolution, evolution happens most there. frequently or most aggressively there. Yeah. So cultivating the literal, I think, is a, or literal, um, is, a, is something, I, I mean, maybe that's what I should do right about. So one of the metaphors I use to describe open global mind is estuaries. I don't use literal zones so much, but estuaries, same sort of thing. It's the meeting of fresh and salt water. Uh, they're rich in nutrients and evolution. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. There's all kinds of symbiotic relationships, all kinds yeah. of goodies going on. The, the, only, the only complicating factor is that those are also the places where humans like to build cities. 
So most estuaries have been paved over uh, and kind of overrun by humans and their pollution and whatever else. But where you can find them, they're, they're super productive great zones. So why, why did we, cult why did we uh, colonize those? Uh, that's because that's um, you get traffic. The, the river was the original highway. Yes. Right. Um, and your civilization, like look at the Nile in Egypt, right? Your civilization followed the river, which flooded the fields, which blah, blah, blah. So you, we kind of, and or the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, which yeah. basically border Mesopotamia until we screw up that region. The estuary <laughs> that is just out, uh, the estuary just outside of New Orleans, as you go into, you know, the Gulf of Mexico, is a mm -hmm. is a very interesting place yeah and it's becoming more interesting because you know as sea level rises you know there are entire um Cultures. roads and things are disappearing all right but there's more stuff being deposited so at the same time it's being destroyed it's building itself it's right being it's, it's, being silt, it's being silted up even even as the the water level rises exactly uh, mark what were you gonna say oh uh like uh Someone was explaining about the contrast between Northern and Southern Europe. Like Northern Europe tends to be flat, lots of rivers, easy transport. Southern Europe, mm. lots of mm. mountains. Mm. People work harder in Southern Europe against the cliche, like in Greece, they work longer hours than in Germany, but they're much less prosperous. Mm. The same thing with uh, uh, North America. Uh, I mean, the Mississippi, Missouri co river complex is like just amazing in, for prosperity. Early roads and transportation as well. Yeah, yeah. Early roads. So stuff stuff got moved around. Then we built canals and you know bridged the, the gaps and all that kind of stuff. Super interesting. But the canals yeah. only last a little while because then we get railroads. Go ahead, Susan. Okay, but I think yes, I think uh, cultivating the littoral um, can be extended to landmass as well. So, um, for instance, here's an example: um, the uh, chanterelle here grow where the oak the oak meets the, the grassland. So there's a book called The Mushroom at the End of the World. Oh yes, <laughs> I about, haven't read it. About, about the Matsutake mushroom and a little TLDR on it is super interesting. It's kind of a meditation on capitalism and everything else. Um, and the Matsutake, um, so, and I'm gonna probably mess some of this up, but the Pacific Northwest where I'm sitting right now um, I think used to be mostly ponderosa pines, massive ponderosas, which got logged out. Yeah. And ponderosas don't come back easily. So what comes back in their place is lodgepole pine and fir. Yeah. So a lot of what shows up here is lodgepole pine and fir. Who loves 10 year old mature lodgepole pines? Matsutake mushrooms. You will find them at the base of a 10 year old lodgepole pine. So one of the ahas from her book, uh, The Mushroom at the End of the World, is that the Matsutake loves disrupted landscapes. Yes. Right? It's part of what you were just saying, Susan, about chanterelles. Uh, and, and that's like really interesting. And so another piece of her book is about how uh, at the time when Japan is running out of Matsutake because they've mostly poured concrete over everything in the country, um, a whole bunch of people who got squeezed out of Southeast Asia at the end of the Vietnam War end up in the Pacific Northwest looking for work. They know how to live in the forest and they know how to forage for food and they prize the Matsutake as because they know mushrooms are valuable. So they become the foragers and create a new sub economy in the Pacific Northwest. Then there's a whole crew of middlemen who grew up who buy them wholesale from uh, the, the foragers and then sell them off to restaurants, markets, whatever. But, but, but her book is all about these sort of cooperating layers, economically, socially, culturally, physically. And, and I haven't finished the book, but it's super interesting. And when when um, Susan talking about uh, cultivating, I always pronounced it littoral, um, but cultivating the littoral, I always think of uh, Denise Caruso's uh, does talk about um, uh, hybrid vigor. Mm -hmm. Oh, and and uh, also thinking about interzones. It's basically the the collision of disparate dynamics seems to me to be a, a an extremely rich. Uh, location. That's what that's what made cities so powerful mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. were you had the chance to actually get a mix of um, uh, blah, 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 a, a mix of ideas and uh, cultures, nutrients, ideas, ages, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and but also, isn't it? No, never mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, go, Susan, go no, ahead. It's, no, just, it's diversity I, density. Yeah. Yeah, but I think um, it's also the case where if we go in to cultivate it and we, uh, you know, cultivating it for my sitake, we might make the mistake of planting all ponderosa pine. Right. So yep. I think I think there needs to be to go to go back to the cultivating the landscape, right? So I'll add in, and and I think Susan, I think this fits into your literal zones in a metaphoric way. That's interesting. But Dave Gray wrote this book, Liminal Thinking, and he was busy sort of drawing these in public with us, sharing his drawings for him really nicely. Uh, and, and about how beliefs come into being and about how we change our minds and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. He had the nine practices of liminal thinking, the six principles of liminal thinking. Who's this uh, whole... again? I forgot. Pardon? Who's this again? Uh, Dave Gray. If you look, I'm screen sharing right now. Uh, I'm screen, screen sharing uh, Dave Gray in my brain. Yeah. And so here's the six principles of liminal thinking, which is under enumerated wisdom, one of my favorite thoughts. Beliefs are models, beliefs are created, beliefs create a shared world, beliefs create blind spots, beliefs defend themselves, beliefs are tied to identity. And then there's nine practices, blah, blah, blah. But I think that the literal zones, metaphorically, are these spaces for investigation, these spaces of a rich mixing of ideas and peoples and cultures. And a piece of what might help move us all forward is creating safe, respectful places where we can do that mixing and learning from each other. Like we're not doing enough of that. We're busy cocooning and busy sheltering in place as, as separate tribes and cultures because we're all under assault by 15 different crises outside in the world, including secular, liberal, crazy people trying to you know, take over our children's lives. Yeah. Um, so so how, do we, how do we cause how do we cause there to be some comfortable literal zones for conversation and co-thinking and co-making? And sometimes the easy entry to that is actually food and music um, because those are non-controversial subjects and who doesn't love the Korean taco? It's like, wait, how did, a, how did bulgogi find its way into a taco? Oh, Los Angeles. Right. Um, you know, Los Angeles is a literal zone. Los, Los Angeles apparently has the largest expat populations of at least 20 different cultures in the world. So if you want to find the largest population of Hmong outside of Laos, you go to Los Angeles. Lather, you can rinse, also go to Fresno. Lather, rinse, repeat. Yeah. 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 It's like when you were asking, like, uh, give examples of some... Uh you know, uh, I, ideal culture or society. The first thing that flashed to my mind was the time I, I spent in Berkeley in kind of late 60s, early 70s. Because as you were saying, confluence of all kinds of cultures, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of different levels, uh, you know, you name it, technology, art, music, you know, and that mixture. And the interesting thing, and this is to Jamais point about uh, going from the granular to the systemic, that. You could, like, I, I find lots of granular sanity, especially in people, in individuals. I say, wow, life is really expressing itself. And this is, this is, really gives me optimism. But then how does that become institutionalized, you know, and part of the system? Because the system has enormous inertia. So maybe one of the ways is these kind of littoral zones where there's a lot of mixing. And, and you know, lots of, you know, it's like a protein soup as they used to yeah, say. Yeah, but I think the thing, is, the thing is there has to be room for, so Jamais, I know you will have thought of this. Uh, there needs to be um, room for expertise to grow. Right. And specialization. And I mean, think about, uh, yeah, just that point. And, and so what's happened is when I looked at China and what China was doing and they made all cities and I thought, no, that's a mistake. Right, you're going to lose everything that was any good in in villages, and you're going to lose those those abilities. Right, many of which are very human. And also in their cities, like in Beijing, they got rid of the hutongs. They basically squished out all of the organic <laughs> organic yeah, yeah, villagey yeah, yeah, parts yeah, yeah, of Beijing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they're and doing it, they're doing the same thing with the uh, um, Shenzhen. And replaced it with stacks of high rises, which are not that or, livable. Or replicating kind of like, other places on the planet. Were, uh, you know, there's a, there's a Paris in China, there's a Stockholm in China. Right. There's right. A, you know they so they have you know built replicas of other places you know to try to import culture that they had their own. Yeah. You know, they have a good... the internet, which is the, sort of the question, did they ask themselves? You know, 
So you could the, do the that. very first high right. rises looked a, ver a lot like the spec buildings that were in the CAD CAM programs that they bought. <laughs> so the so the the, <laughs> in, the conventional wisdom that I had heard, uh, which I've never been able to fact check, is that there are many buildings in China that are exactly the default drawing in AutoCAD. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right, Jerry. That's what I, they were like. That looks okay. Let's just build that one. Yeah, this is a good. This is a good building. Let's yeah. use that. Let's right. just make that. Let's just go. Um, I'm just going to leave because I, I need to go get ready for something else. On this topic, I visited uh, an organization called ICRASAT, which is the International Crop Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. Right? Didn't know anything about it, but a friend of mine was the assistant to the Secretary General of this place. Right? It's outside of um, Hyderabad, India. And what they specialize in, you know, that seed bank that they've got up near the, you know, North Pole, Small which is under, underground and, Small flooded, yeah. and so, flooded, which is just stupid. Yeah. So Icrasat has all the seeds that grow in the most inhospitable places in the planet. No, you know, very little rain, crappy soil, right? And so they're showing me all, all the things that they do. And, you know, I don't know know much, but I said, you know, it seems to me that the hero here is Millet. Of all the things that you showed me, all right, you know, Millet, you know, seems to be, um, you know, low, you know, consumption of, of uh, resources. It, it, it's pretty high, high nutritional value. Um, in the United States, it's bird seed, okay, but in India, it's roti, bread, okay. And I said, sounds to me like it's going to be a superfood, right? At some point, it somebody's going to... It, it, didn't it come from China, though? I mean, China... I don't know where it came from, all right? Well, but I'm just... there certainly is a, was, was a huge culture. Of, yeah, of but what, what's cool about that is after making that pronouncement, I don't know, seven years ago, um, I got a note from Joanna you know, Pataka uh, Kotli, and she said... We have adopted millet as our, you know, hero grain uh, for the next decade. I said, right. So, so the guy who knows nothing, all right. Um, I don't think that they took my my recommendation that that it was an insight for them, but they just kept going, and this is what they're hanging their hat on. And I would love to buy some bread that's based on roti as opposed to wheat, all right, because it's 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 perfectly good way to make um food mm -hmm. so. um, i put in the chat there's a thing called fonio that i just learned about a couple of weeks ago which is a, a kind of millet that's becoming kind of a popular food and becoming more available in stores and one of my little Fantastic. goals is one of my little goals is next time i'm in a more or less natural food store around here to look for some fonio like try it you know it's um this also like the one of the things that grows well and we have ad adapted over the years is all of the uh, brassicas Mm -hmm. And they're all over the place and they have spread and they grow in multitude of environments. Now, Fantastic. yeah, so those are, so, okay, it's, it's uh, you know, millet and uh, brassicas, everybody. No, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> and well, I gotta crazy. go, it was great seeing you folks. Yeah, we're gonna Cheers. wrap up the call in a sec. Thanks, Kevin, thanks for being here. Hi. Um, it's crazy how many things come out of brassica and one of my discoveries in lockdown is Gailan. Anybody cook gailan ever? I've eaten it. Oh, I've heard that word recently. Where did you find it? So gailan, go to your local 99 Ranch. Um, yeah. So here we here we have 99 Ranch, H Mart, and Okonom and uh, not Okonomiyaki. Uh, oh, there's a third there's a third Asian market that's really big, Uajimaya. Yeah. Um, so so I have been doing short trips to Asia. Uh -huh. Basically, I'll I'll disappear and go to one of these three stores for a couple hours walk every aisle and i feel like i've been to like the changji airport and back except i didn't have to do like the the vaccine passport dance um but um where was i going with uh oh gailan so gailan is chinese broccoli it's basically uh, kind of stalky uh, but not as thick as broccoli stalks and then a leaf that looks like a spinach leaf but not really tastes great and the stalks are, are, are tender and you just chop up the stalks, cook the whole thing, 
right. uh, or, or steam the whole thing, but they're delicious. They're really good. I mean, it's like the, uh, like the 12 foot kale that grew in, was it Bermuda? Um, and one of the reasons it grew there and became very common across um, till one of the, until one of the, the governors of the, of the place decided they needed to broaden their, um, in case the British left, they needed to broaden their agriculture, but they, they turned the stalks into walking sticks. <laughs> So, so there's this business of, you know, kind of all natural or whatever is just, it's mistaken. We've been messing with these things forever and, and, you know, in the adaptation. So for that's those, those ideas and the, ga the galleon, which I was thinking about too recently is out of a gastro obscura, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's um, Atlas obscura and then there's gastro. Uh, obscura, which is all of those people coming out of the woodwork who have arcane knowledge about cool. all kinds of different kinds of food. I had no idea they had. I think it's part of Atlas, right? I think it is. Yeah. It looks like it is from, I just did a quick search. Yeah. And it looks just like it. So it must be. Yeah. Yeah. It's their subset. It's so cool. And I love Atlas Obscura. It's really cool. I do too. I mean, I, I follow it avidly. But gastro obscura because I've been into food forever because we had such. Never mind. I learned to cook be, out of self defense. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I love cooking. I'm yeah, the cook in, I'm the cook in the family. So cook, cooking is the closest I'll get to alchemy. So yeah, well I, I find I can it, watch someone do it all day. Well, no, don't do it all day. No, you no, could no watch, I can watch, could watch someone, someone do it all day. Uh huh. I, oh, someone, I don't know that I could watch somebody do it. I like doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've also like, my kitchen is suddenly stocked with a whole bunch of Asian ingredients that I didn't know about, you know, a decade okay. ago. I've got, a, and, and on my list of things to buy next time in one of the, I'm in one of these markets is dark, sweet soy sauce. Yes. Yeah. Because I've got other stuff. I've got mirin and I've got rice vinegar and I've got, Oh, you, you know. need, and you need the Japanese version if you're going to do Japanese food. So, so I, there's this, uh, uh, what's it called? It's, it's a woman who lives in San Francisco. She's trying to educate us all about how to cook Japanese food. Mm -hmm. And um, I forget what it is and I should put it in. Oh, I hope you remember. Another, another good magic ingredient is Shaoxing cooking wine. Yeah. Yeah. She says you need the Japanese stuff because that's what makes it, the food tastes different. And, uh, and she has recommendations for what to get. And she has recommendations that are gettable by, by m most people living in a place like, we, you know, the Bay Area, Portland, the West Coast. I am, I'm dying to get grandmother tours of these Asian markets. I really <laughs> want, I really, really, really want somebody who knows. Somebody's from doing that. From the different mushrooms, from the different dried fish, from the different canned foods from the Philippines. Like what? What in here to do with what? Like, I don't know what to do with a bitter melon. It looks terrible. Why would I eat a bitter melon? But I know, I've watched a couple of videos online. And I'm like, all right, maybe I do that. So it's a, yes. Okay. So where was this? I don't know. There's somewhere there is a markets. So 99 Ranch is, is in the Bay Area. There's like three 99 ranches yeah, in, know, in San Francisco, know, around no. San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're fabulous. I remember discovering 99 Ranch uh, in Daly City, I guess. Yeah, there's one yeah, in No, not, not Daily City, uh, Pacifica. Uh, oh, Pacifica. Yeah, there was one in Pacifica. Good Lord, because there's yeah. one in uh, uh, Foster City. Oh, thank you. Yay, Red Boat Fish Sauce. I, I, I have to be really lean on fish sauce because April, if she sensed that there's fish sauce, even in the atmospheric, like in, in parts per million, she'd be like, no, no, not going there. So, and I love like, you know, hairy fish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anchovies, all that kind of stuff. I would put anchovies on everything. I remember arriving in Hong Kong on the way to India. And uh, I was in 16 at the time, I think. And my mother made us get off the plane. She said, you know, you may never be in Hong Kong again. And I got off the plane and it was drying fish. And the stench was so horrible. I didn't know that's what it was until years and years later. Hmm. And, um, and I thought, and they all told us how bad India smells. And I thought, I thought I could do anything, but I couldn't do this. Cool. Well, she said, I think it's really worse than Hong Kong, then I'm in trouble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I think that's a very nice note to end this call on. <laughs>
the stench of drying fish. Woohoo! It's perfect. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. That was like a really nice journey. Shamea, I want to figure out some way to flesh out, express, and then deepen our conversation about how bad, how good were older cultures? How does that work? Who's done the work and all that? Because I'm, I garden these things into this brain thing. I can put it there. OGM is trying to create a shared medium like that, which we don't have yet, but we're sort of moving toward that. And I think that that shared memory needs to have expressions of these kinds of debates and conversations in it. And I okay. would love it. I would love it if you banned the words good and bad. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Oh, I'm gonna. Oh, thank you. Wow, these these recipes, hot damn. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kelly. You are a they're goddess. All, they're all just super quick and easy and really delicious. I'm on it. I'm on it. And and Thanks. we're doing more salads now toward the end of uh, of summer. Um, thanks, y'all. Uh, Hi, Pandora. Nice to meet you, Pandora. Happy healing. Pandora. If she doesn't work out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would be a tragedy because she's incredibly affectionate. Isn't um, it Long Ridge yeah. is a really nice place for pets. It's not good for light ginger colored cats, however, because Jerry, my favorite cat died on one of the last tea and cordite meetings here because I asked you to piss all around the thing to kill this black thing that was chasing all the everything, right? Did, well, did I knew it. she would. I knew he wouldn't be there when I got home and he wasn't. Oh, crap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mine are all indoor cats. Indoor yes. always. Yeah. So. All right. Okay. Well, that's a more sobering note to end the call on. Oh, but.